Welcome to the Virtual CPA Success Show, where we're 100% focused on helping service-based businesses achieve success. Are you a business owner interested in learning how to scale your business? Has your business reached over $1 million in annual revenue? Then this podcast is for you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's podcast. I know this topic that we're going to cover today is a really important one because as a CFO and as a consultant, it's something that we talk about with our clients every single day. So I'm really excited to get into this topic with uh, Jamie Van Kijk from Growing Your Business or Growing Your Team. Uh, sorry about that. And so she's here to talk to us about hiring. Uh, so welcome to the show, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me today. And then as always, we are joined by uh, Jody Grundon. Yeah, this is going to be confusing. So when I say Jamie... <laughs> I'm referring to which one. Right. <laughs> I think this is one of the first it. podcasts I've done where one of the hosts is also named Jamie. So <laughs> and, and it's spelled the same way. So it makes it even more confusing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jamie. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, and your company? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I am the owner of Growing Your Team. At Growing Your Team, we work with small business owners to guide them through the hiring process. Our aim is to help all business owners learn to hire like a pro. My backgrounds that helped me get here was I came from corporate leadership. So it's a surprise to a lot of people that I didn't come from the HR realm. I was in internal operations at an international marketing company. And one of the things that I got a lot of experience with was hiring because my team was entry level into the company. And I had great team members, which meant they meant they were always getting poached to go elsewhere into the organization <laughs> and grow their career. So I was always having to refill positions. And so I got a lot of experience with hiring. Also, as I mentioned, I had a really good team. So I wasn't dealing with a lot of issues other managers were dealing with day to day. So when they needed help with hiring, because they had open positions, I would jump in to help them because I had the time. So I learned a lot of what does it mean to help someone else hire? Because even though... The title was the same from my position to their position. Their team members worked on different accounts. They worked with different people internally. And there was different dynamics that would make someone successful in their role. I also then got tagged by HR to work on a huge hiring initiative where we hired 18 people in a matter, I think it was five weeks. And we wanted everyone to start on the same day. And so I got a lot of experience then with the HR side of hiring. So I love that job. I love the company I was working for, but I always knew I wanted to start my own business. So after my second daughter was born, I returned to work, then realized it's now or never. So I turned in my notice to start a software development company with my husband. Six months later, I realized how much I hated software development. It was <laughs> not for me at all, and I needed to figure out something else. So I took advantage of the chamber membership that we had. I went to a lot of networking events. And as I was talking to people, I found out that small businesses didn't know how to hire. They, I hear problems all the time. It was like, oh, it took me five years to get my first really good hire. I had to go through 70 members before I found one that was actually good for my business. And I learned that most small business owners never hired before doing it within their own business, or they were coming from corporate jobs where they had HR departments, senior leaderships, job postings already created. They were pretty much being given everything that they needed. And now that they needed to create it on their own, they were lost. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know the steps of the process. And I decided, hey, I have all this hiring knowledge. Let me help you. So now it's been about four and a half years, almost five years that I've been helping small business owners through the hiring process. That's uh, that's pretty awesome. The uh, it, It's kind of funny because we uh, we get on calls. I, I got tons of questions for you, by the way. I'll start with the first one here. We get the, <laughs> we get the, we, we, I just had a conversation with about five, uh, uh, owners of accounting firms. And uh, we were talking about uh, different, uh, you know, issues that we've had in hiring lately. And, and one of the big things that they'd mentioned is that I, I got this, I got this employee that I probably should let go, but I can't find somebody to let go. What do you tell somebody like that? Because it happens a lot, right? You know, we, we keep somebody bad thinking that there's no solution for that person. And then they just kind of like, tank the rest of the team, you know, because the, the team knows they're bad, they're doing not doing well or whatever. Um, you know, obviously, keeping them is not the right thing. But what, what in this type of environment, what, what, what should we do? Yeah, so the first thing I always tell them is you have to let that team member go. 
they are wasting your money keeping them on your team. Not only because their poor performance means that they're not worth their paycheck in terms of what you're expecting out of a team member, they're taking your time. As you mentioned, they're kind of a drain on other team members and their resources. So this person is creating such a negative impact that in most cases, you're better off without them even for a short period of time. So if I know it's hard, but you have to let bad team members go because you're wasting your time, money, and energy on them. And that time, wait? money, huh? Do we wait? Do we wait and let them go before we identify this next person or what, what, what's, what's the timing there? I, I would honestly say the situation probably depends on how bad they are, what they're doing that is actually of value versus what they're doing that is making them a waste of money. You know, if there's someone that's producing enough value that you can keep them on and they're not overly hurting your business, then you can potentially keep them on until you find that next person. Otherwise, you got to let them go because like I said, they're taking your time, they're taking your money, they're taking your energy. And that can then be put into that time, money, and energy into finding the right person. There are times with certain positions, hiring takes a while. And I always advise my clients, you want to hold off for the right person and not jump to put a body into a seat. So hiring can take time, especially if you're looking for something specific where it's not like this person has transferable skills, but you're saying this person actually needs experience in this thing. These people need these licenses, They need this education. They need these certifications. And that makes your pool really small, but good hires are out there. And if you're not able to find them, it's probably because your process is not set up to speak to the right people. It's kind of like marketing. You know, if we put out marketing that we target everybody, we really target nobody for our business. So we always say we need to speak to the right person with marketing and it's the same with hiring. You need to make sure that what you're putting out there actually speaks to the person where someone reads that and says, hey, I want to apply for this job. This is the top of my list of job opportunities. What about um, in, in the situation that Joey described? I know we've tried this before and sometimes it's worked really well for us and sometimes it has worked terribly for us, but I'm um, trying to end the relationship well and talking to an employee that's not 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 doing a great job and saying, hey, this is just a bad fit. Um, we're going to move on from you, but but instead of, you know, most people give this two weeks, let's give it a month for you to to kind of offboard and hopefully we can find someone in that time or maybe two months or give you time to find, to find a role. How often does that work? And is that something you recommend? So once again, I'm going to say that's a big, it depends because you have some people that they're trying really hard. It's a bad fit because it's just not a match for skill, but you know, this is a person that is really putting their all into the position. They're a person that's probably still going to act in high integrity in that situation and really help you to the end. But you're going to have other people that are not the right fits because there's other things going on. And then you put yourself at risk because you're keeping someone on your team that potentially is disgruntled because of the fact that they know their position is ending. And it might, it might mean they start doing things that are malicious to harm your business. They start saying things to your clients if they're external facing that harms your business. And they can be doing a lot of things that simply can harm your business. And it's easier just to end that relationship and move on. So once again, it's gonna depend on who that person is. But in all these scenarios, it shouldn't be that all of a sudden this is the first conversation you're having about their performance that you're exiting them from the organization. <laughs> right. There should have been those conversations ahead of time about performance improvements and, and everything like that. So it shouldn't be a surprise that they are no longer a fit. And I'll, I can give you an example of something that I've been through personally that kind of falls into this scenario is one of uh, my, when I was very early in management, I had a team member that it was really not working out. We had gone through some performance improvement things. We had made some changes to the role, like with the dynamics between her and the other teams internally that she was working on to really help that relationship. And it still just really wasn't seeming like the best fit. And we were having a conversation one day and all of a sudden the conversation, I blurted out, maybe this isn't the right role for you and you need to find something else. And then as a new manager, I was like, oh my God, did I just tell my employee that? Like, am I going to get in trouble? Did I just tell my employee that they should quit pretty much? And that team member came back to me a few days later and said, I want to thank you for that conversation because it was the most honest conversation I ever had with a manager. 
And you're right. This is not the role for me. I am not happy here and I need to find something else. And she gave me about, I think it was about a month and a half to two month notice to say, this is my date I'm leaving. I'm here. I'm going to help you get the next person on, train them if we can find someone to to replace me in that time. But then I'm exiting because I need to do something that's going to make me happy. And so there are scenarios where, yes, people will stay on because they really value you and your business and they see what you've done. But it is one of those situations you got to tread carefully and see what's going on because you don't want to keep someone in your business that's not happy and is going to cause harm. For sure. So get rid of toxic people is what you're saying. So toxic people... Get, yes. get rid of them really as quick as you can. Not, don't, yes. don't, uh, don't delay it. Yeah. And it's one of those things I've worked with a client before where some of their toxic employees were, were quitting, but they're like, oh my gosh, my employees are quitting. How do I keep these people? How do I change them around when they're a toxic employees? And I was just like, just be thankful that they're leaving. Like it's good. <laughs> it takes so much energy to turn a toxic employee into a good employee that if they're deciding that, Hey, I need to get out of this situation, let them. It's better to hire someone who's going to be a positive impact from the start than to keep someone on your team that's toxic. No, I definitely, I definitely can agree with that. I know uh, at we've we've experienced that at any any job you've been at, you've experienced that toxic employee, both as a peer, as a supervisor, like it's someone you're supervising is in that role, and it's just it makes it, it makes it very hard a hard place to work is when there's a toxic employee within the within the establishment. It's a very it's very it can it can bring a company down pretty quickly. Yes. Yes, it can. With the uh, with, with with the way the job market is right now, um, you know, how how quickly can we find really good employees? I mean, are they are they are they still out there? Are they? I mean, is it something that takes months? Should it be weeks, days, hours, minutes? So I think with it, it all depends on the position that you're hiring for. So if you're hiring for a position where someone doesn't necessarily have to been in that specific role before, and we're looking at a lot of transferable skills, you're most likely going to get a lot more applicants. If you're looking for something more junior, you're most likely going to get a lot more applicants because that application pool is bigger. Like I said, when you're looking for something really specific, it becomes smaller and smaller. The higher up positions become smaller and smaller with that applicant pool. And the timing, it depends on a lot of factors. With all our positions that we're helping to hire or helping our clients get through, we're getting mm-hmm. applicants, but sometimes they'll post a job and get 100 applicants in a weekend. And other times it's in that first week, we might get three and they come in on a rolling basis. What you really need to look for is what's the quality of applicants coming in and are they the right fit for you? I would say most of our clients, it's taking between six to eight weeks to fill a position. But one of the things you have to remember with that is it takes time to interview. A lot of sometimes that time is more so the time as the business owner you're dedicating to the process than how the candidates are coming in. You need to post the job. You need to actually review the resumes that are coming in. You need to schedule interviews. And we always say you need there needs to be at least two rounds of interviews because you need to have two connections with someone before you hire them. So you need to schedule, you need to move those candidates that move on to that final interview round. Then you need to make your decision and you need to present an offer. And even when you move through quickly, so you're right on top of that next step, you're scheduling those next interviews, it can still take a few weeks to get through everything just Mm -hmm. based on coordinating schedules. So the applicant pool out there changes constantly. You know, things look different right now than they did six months ago, than they did two years ago. Things are always changing, but there's still good candidates out there. One of the things that you'll notice you know, right now is there are some companies that are scaling back. You hear We hear every day about a new tech company that's having massive layoffs. And that's not just tech positions, it's all positions for a lot of them, which means there's a lot of people on the job market because they have to be because they're losing jobs or they're fearing that what's happened at some of these other companies is going to happen in their company. Mm-hmm. But then you have the people that are switching jobs just like at any time, people that are saying, Hey, I'm just not happy here. I need something new. And so there's always there's always people looking. Sometimes it just fluctuates a little bit about how many people are on the job market at a time, but there's always people out there that are looking for a new opportunity. Uh, yeah, I think Oh, go ahead, Jamie. I was going to say, yeah, as, as we change into this, it sounds like the hiring environment's changing a little bit. And I, I feel like 
I did not love the previous hiring environment where it's taking me a long time to hire people. But um, I'd say on the flip side where there's a lot of candidates, there's a, there's a problem there as well where you want to make sure you're getting a candidate who's the right fit. So if you're interviewing a lot of people for a role, if, if people are desperate for a job, oftentimes they'll make themselves fit into a role they might not fit for. So I, I always find that challenging when you're in a really strong hiring market. It's like, okay, I have five great candidates. How do I know which one of these is going to be the best fit for the role, not just the one that can talk me into that they're the best fit for the role? How do you how do you help with that um, problem? That is a great question. And that's really where we specialize here in growing your team. It, it all starts with knowing who is the right fit for your role. So when we look at things and uh, let's just let's just talk about like accountants for a second it's a pretty basic standard role you're doing the basically the same things at every every company you work for there's there's slight variances depending on maybe cadence of meetings how people want reports delivered there's some variance there but other than that the the standard of the role is pretty basic however what's going to make you happy, Jamie, could be completely different than what makes Jody happy. And so when we look at things, we say, this is a role that's fitting in your organization. What are you going to be happy with? What are your team dynamics? What do you want out of this person that's going to make you say, yes, paying that paycheck is worth it because this is an amazing team member. And when we start with focusing on that, we can then develop an entire hiring process around uncovering these abilities. So there's there's some positions we help hiring for that are kind of like questions specific to like the technical abilities of the role are, are pretty slim because we know we can ask these questions, really gauge their area of expertise here. And are they can they do what is needed? But then the rest of the interview is focused around, okay, will they actually fit within our organization? Am I going to like them? And so we develop questions that uncover things we need to know about that candidate to determine if they are a fit. And, and we, a lot of times, like, excuse me, like I was saying, like we create bespoke hiring strategies. So every interview guide we create for a client is 100% unique to that position. And it's all focused around what do you need to uncover? And we love asking questions that are not your standard interview questions, but also not those like outside the box. Like if you're a color crayon, what would you be? Not those type of questions, but they're really designed. They're specifically created to uncover what you want to know. And we love the follow-up question. So we have an interview question that we ask and then sometimes we have a bunch of follow-up questions that say, okay, maybe that was your rehearsed answer. So <laughs> now we're going to dive deeper. We're going to dive deeper and deeper. Let's find out what you really did. How did you impact that scenario? You know, is this something that you're saying that you would do, but you really have no experience doing that? So it's really about creating those interview questions and creating a process that helps you uncover can they actually fit in your organization? Can they do the job the way you want it done? Because there are differences. You know, think about, this is one of the examples I love to give is sales positions. You could sometimes have two different cultures in a sales organization. One being make the sale no matter what and have it be the biggest sale possible. Push everything so that uh, invoice is as large as it can possibly be. And then you have other sales organizations where it's the customer comes first in their needs. We don't care if it's a smaller invoice, as long as the customer is getting what they're, they need and they're happy because it most likely means they'll then come back and spend more money with us. Don't push things on the clients that they don't need because that's not what we want. If you take someone from that, I'm going to push for that bigger sale and push more and upsell and all these things and put them in an environment where then it's it's okay that it's a small invoice. It's like, we don't care. What does the customer need? Don't oversell them. They're not going to be happy. It's not the same dynamic and vice versa. So both people could be great salespeople, but what's really right for you? What's going to fit in your culture? And the interview process will really help you determine that when you ask the right questions. So you, you'd mentioned that um, you had two layers of questioning, right? So you, you or two, two layers of interviews, I guess. Um, to two touch points. Is, is that pretty common as two touch point? Because we used to have at one point, we used to have like eight touch points and we had many people touching and that's when the, that's when the, uh, that's, you know, a few years back, but now it, in order to do that, you'd lose a candidate pretty quickly because they'd probably find a job within the, you know, before the second or third touch point there. So um, is two touch points a pretty standard or is that, is that what you have to do in today's environment? 
So I would say a minimum of two. Typically we say no more than three. And if there is more than three, you better have a really good reason why that, that fourth or fifth interview needs to be there. Mostly because you're asking a lot of a candidate. And like you said, typically you're not the only person interviewing that candidate. And the more complicated you make your process, the more likely they're going to be like, do I really want to work with this company? Because it doesn't seem like they have things very well organized. You know, why am I talking to this person? So we always say the first touch point should be a quick virtual interview, whether it's phone over Zoom, something like that, where you're just asking basic questions to really determine, okay, I thought this from their resume. Does it actually match what I think? And so typically we say that interview is no more than 30 minutes. And then they get moved on to the next round of interviews, where then you go into a lot more in-depth questions. You talk about different things and everything from there. For a lot of companies we work with, for a lot of positions, that's enough. But then sometimes they do want another interview. And that interview, we typically say, or most of the time, it ends up being a team interview. So there's more people there. It's more a panel style interview versus just one person interviewing them. And it's normally different people in the room. The same people might also be in the room, but it's adding additional people in the room a lot of times. So that way they, you can get that different dynamic and everything there. It's very taxing for the interviewee to have to go and have an interview with eight different people versus having one panel interview where those eight people are all in the room together. So you have to think about what is best for the position. Now there's sometimes gonna be higher up positions where you really want to dive deeper into that. They really do need a lot of touch points and everything because you're making a huge investment. But for the most part with small businesses, you're not at that level necessarily yet. So the at least two, I would say no more than three is what's gonna make you successful in the process. You can uncover what you need in those touch points and it's not super taxing on the candidate. So for the first interview, it's just a quick, quick 30, 30 minute interview. You're you're getting to know them, making sure that they're the they're what's actually on their resume. And, and then the second interview you're saying is more of a panel interview or recommended a panel interview. No, the third um, interview or, would be the, the one that'd interviews. be more of the panel. The second okay, so one, second you can have a few people in there, but I know for a lot of my clients, it's typically just with the hiring manager. Okay. So it's the same person I had the first interview. In most cases. Oh, it is. So in most cases, it's is the same person that, um, you know, obviously when we help with our full service recruiting, we do that first interview. So our clients are not cool. a part of that interview. They then do the second interview. When mm -hmm. our clients are doing the process on their own and we're guiding them through, it's typically that hiring manager, that CEO that's in that first interview. And then it's them in that second interview. And like you said, they might invite someone else into that second interview just to get uh, another set of ears and eyes on the process. But you know, typically it is the same person if you're doing the entire process yourself from the first interview to the second interview. So a question on panel interviews, and we, we do use panel interviews. And again, sometimes it's three people in a room, sometimes it's two. But my question when it comes to this is, what if the people interviewing disagree on the candidate? Like how do, how do you deal with moving those candidates forward? And I know there's different levels of disagreement. There's one person hates the person, one person loves the person. There's one person's neutral, one person loves. One person kind of likes, one person is neutral. Like how, how do you kind of decide whether you move a candidate forward when the two people that are interviewing them disagree on, their qual on whether they're the right person for the role? Good question. So once again, I think it depends on what they're disagreeing on and who is actually going to be managing that new team member. So if one of the people in that panel interview is the person that's going to be the leader for this position, they have more of a say than really anybody else. They should be taking in that, that feedback because sometimes we just form, a, we're human. We form emotional connections to people. And so we might say, oh my God, this person is amazing. And that other person pulls up things that are actually valid reasons to not hire this person. That it's like, wait, but they can't actually do the job that we need them to hire for. So those, those that feedback needs to be listened to. But at the same time, at the end of the day, the hiring manager has the decision-making ability. They decide who moves forward. They decide who gets the role. Um, if it's 
if it's something where let's say it is that panel, it's people that they'll be working with. So it's maybe this is a manager you're hiring and this is the team that they're going to be managing, or it's a room of their peers. So it's a leader and these are other leaders in the organization. That's when things become a little bit different because you want to make sure that you're not entering them into a hostile situation where someone's mm -hmm. like really adamant of, no, we should not be hiring this person. I do not want to be working with this person. And then saying, too bad, here you're forced to work with this person. And in those situations, that might be one of those things where we say, okay, it wasn't a part of our initial process, but we think we need to add an additional interview or additional conversation, even if it's then just a phone conversation or a virtual thing and not have them come back into the office where we ask additional questions that address the concerns that were brought up. So we say, okay, we want to either validate these concerns and say, this person is not the right person, or we want to say, okay, well, we heard that in the other interview. Now that we addressed it, it's actually something different and we're okay. We're comfortable with this candidate based on the new information we uncovered. So one more question in, in this topic. Um, so in addition to the concern about, not the concern, but the, the differing personalities when it comes to hiring, the other problem that I've seen come across is where you mentioned this earlier, but the turning point for me in interviewing and hiring was when I stopped paying attention to personality and I started listening to the words the person was saying. Okay, what is this person actually telling me in their questions? And I loved how you said, you know, there's those there's the first question, but then there's follow-up questions to try to get to the, the depth of it. So how do you train someone that's job is to be a um, a manager? Their job is to be a manager, their job is to manage people, or their job is to be a CFO. How do you train those people to actually be really good interviewers and, and look for the right things? Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing is you should understand the why behind every question that you're asking. You know, we're not asking questions to waste people's time. We're asking questions because it's going to uncover something we need to know about a candidate. So when you really understand what you're trying to uncover, it helps you look back to say, okay, was that a good sounding answer or was that something that shows they're actually good at the role? So you mm -hmm. need to know the why. The other thing is you need to take notes. So that way you're not going off of your opinion and thoughts and stuff. You can actually look back to say, this is what they said. Now, does your notes have to be a complete transcript of the entire interview? No, but you should at least be writing down things that can jog your memory of what they actually shared for that answer. And the last thing is, and this is sometimes I think it's a little bit harder for some people, and it's really one of those skills that you have to work on if it doesn't come naturally, is being the detective throughout it. It's saying, okay, well, they told me in this answer this, but then in this answer over here, they said something that completely went against that once they were given examples and seeing other themes that come up throughout that interview that either show that, yes, they're capable of this thing that they said, or no, they're really not when they put it to the test, that they can say the right things when they are asked about it directly, but everything else says no. So it's kind of playing detective. It's reading between the lines because you connect their answers. It's when we're looking... You know, for example, there's a lot of things that we look for on interviews that we don't necessarily have a question around. There's a lot of things, for example, communication. We ask mm -hmm. some questions around communication, but the other thing is we're just listening throughout the entire interview about communication. We might ask a question about team dynamics, but we're also figuring out for from other questions where they had to work with teams to succeed in that area, how do they actually work with that team? Do they mention things about their team? You know, how do they talk about people? So we're looking at sometimes those things where it's like, we didn't directly ask it, but we're putting the puzzle pieces together to uncover what we need. Very interesting. And so, so we've hired the person. Uh, we've got through the interviewing stage, three interviews. We hired the person and now we've got to onboard that person. Can you walk us through what your recommendations are for onboarding? Yes. All right. So unless you're a company that has a whole training department, the reality is that you probably don't have time to be sitting with that team member every hour, their first day, their first week. So you need to set up a training plan that allows them to be able to do some things independently while also understanding that they're still in the learning process. And sometimes you'll say, but I'm hiring someone that's highly skilled. They should know what to do which is true, but they don't yet know how to do it your way in your company, access files that are needed or anything like that. So you need to teach them 
what it means to be sex successful in your organization, how to navigate things, who their counterparts are. There's all those things that are going on. So with your onboarding plan, it's going to vary in time depending on the position, depending on your company, depending on the skill of the person. Will last The onboarding plan will last a series of time and you need to focus on what can I teach them where then they can do something independently. Then what can I teach them next where then they can do something higher level or something different and keep going through that until you've trained them on everything that they need to know. Also with onboarding, a lot of times we look at it as this multi-step approach where you show them, you do it together, they do it with you watching or reviewing the work after the fact, and then they do it independently. Or sometimes we add another step in there where they do it and you just do random spot checks afterwards to see, okay, is this is this correct? So you're not checking everything, you're checking it randomly until they get to be independent. That process can sometimes move rather quickly where it's one day and you've gone through all those steps and mm -hmm. other processes, other things they're learning, it's gonna take a few weeks till they get to that point. So for example, I was recently helping a client that brought on a new bookkeeper some of the tasks they only do once a month. In some of their clients, it's a little bit more complex. They said, well, we can't expect them probably until like three months in for us to completely let go of the reins because we need to show them one month, then they need to do it the next month with us holding their hand or checking behind them or being really involved. And then we can trust them by month three to be able to do it independently. But it takes three months to get there because they don't have any option to do those tasks besides that once a month task that needs to get done. So the onboarding plan is going to look differently, but it's really about teaching your expectations and helping them understand what you want so you are happy as the boss. So would you have, would you hire specific people to do that, or is that more the person that's going to be managing or responsible for that for that team member? So you mean when it comes to creating the plan or helping to no, train? When it comes to executing the training, so yeah. yeah, we're doing the training yeah, on the training side. So for the training part of it, it's going to be whoever holds the knowledge right now, um, whoever is has the ability to train them. For a lot of the stuff, especially if it's something that you are currently doing, you need to be involved in that training because you're teaching them your expectations. If you're the one who's been holding on to all of those tasks, you're the one that's going to determine, are they doing it right or are they not? And someone else can't train on that if you're the one only one who's been doing it before. Uh, when it comes to some things like, let's say it's something really technical, like there's a system that they need to learn, you can look at other resources. Does that tool and system have like a training academy or something like that, where you can say, all right, we need you to learn the system. Here's something you can go and do on your own. Or um, I've had clients where they have to do things in the vendor system. And the vendors actually hold training for new people coming on. So they run the training. So sometimes there are ways you can outsource the training or guide the person to do independent learning. But a lot of the times you're going to have to train them, or it could be another internal team member if that internal team member has the knowledge. So then, so then as you're training people, um, you're either going to have, the, you're going to have the knowledge person will be the person that's overseeing uh, the training. Um, how do you determine if the person's getting it or not? You know, cause they're, they're new to the system, you know, like for instance, like for us, you know, we work fully remote and have been doing it for 10 years, you know, so that's a train. That's a, that's a learning curve thing. You know, mm -hmm. we, we do things differently. You know, we, we, it's just not accounting, it's consulting and, and forecasting. We do a lot of other things that a typical accountant wouldn't do. So in coming into a position like that, how do you determine or what how do you determine they're getting it and what what time frame should we allow them to get it yeah yeah so the time frame is going to be one of those things where it depends it it makes a difference on what it is and how often they can practice that skill and also are they progressing and that's one of the things you really want to look for with are they getting it is are they getting better do they understand it do they take part of what you taught them and are they able to apply it one of the things that really matters when it comes to are they getting it is people have different point of views that come from different backgrounds. They have different experiences. And sometimes they think they get it based on what you said, but what you're saying and what they're hearing and how they interpret it are two different things. So sometimes you need to say, okay, that's great, but it actually needs to be like this instead of this. And the here is why. And that why is important because that why helps to shift their brain to say, okay, 
this is a different scenario or this is why it's important to be that way. And it's not that my boss is just being picky and trying to micromanage my work, that it actually makes a difference. That why is important when you see that what they're doing and what you want don't align. And like I said, with that training, are they progressing? If you give them feedback, is it better the next time around? If it's better, but not perfect, okay, they improved. They took the feedback and they started applying it. Now let's talk and train on what they're still missing. And are we are they progressing in that way that shows that they're learning? I love to get the, give this analogy when it comes to training is think of your favorite movie that you've watched a million times. You loved it so much after the first time that you watched it again. And what happened when you watched that movie again? You picked up on different things. You were able to make connections that you weren't able to make the time before because you, the first time you went in, you had no information about it. The second time you went in, you had this baseline information. Sometimes it's because you already knew things were happening in the future that you're like, oh my gosh, they foreshadowed to that. And other things are like, oh, I didn't catch that. And if you watch it again and again, sometimes you catch on to more and more. The movie didn't change. It's the exact same thing you're watching every time, but because your base of knowledge keeps growing, you keep catching on to stuff that you didn't even realize you were missing the first time around. So it's a lot with training. They might think they got everything, fully understand what you're telling them, but they didn't absorb it all yet because everything is new. So you sometimes have to train them again, even go through the exact same training because they need to now build on the knowledge that they gained the first time around. So I, I have to jump in here because... I need to know, and I think this is probably a good ending point for this podcast anyways, but I need to know from all three of us, okay, Jody, starting with Jody, what is the movie you've seen so many times that every time you watch it, you pick up something new? Oh, geez. The movie, probably The Accountant is probably like one of my favorite movies and, and it has nothing to do with being an accountant. I just think it's... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, you're 100% right. You uh, pick things up the second time around that you would never have thought, or it was just you're just watching it the first time around. Um, yeah, it's definitely an accountant. So, so Jody doesn't want to be just a normal accountant. He wants to be an accountant with machine guns and detective exactly. detective work. So, <laughs> so he's seen that a hundred times. All right, Jamie, what is the movie you've seen so many times that every time you see it, you pick up something different? Yeah, so the first movie that comes to my mind is the movie Now and Then. I loved it as a kid and I've seen it multiple times and it's it's now watching it as an adult and having kids that are coming into like that age and everything. It's you just view it also from a different perspective and everything because I'm at a different point in my life, but I just I love the story. Okay, I've not seen that one, so I'm going to put it on my list to to watch it. Who who's in that? It's Anyone? oh gosh. I know uh, Christina I'm, Ritchie. I'm trying okay, to think I'm of who else. It I don't down. know. It's, there we go. It's from the okay. 90s, I believe. It, well, <laughs> yeah, it's from the 90s. So it's a it's like a young girl coming of age movie. So I'm sure oh. it probably wasn't on your list of things. To <laughs> Maybe watch. I'll watch that with my my 15 year old daughter. Maybe she'll enjoy yeah. it. <laughs> It'd be a good thing to watch with with your daughter. Okay. All right. So for me, that movie is Tombstone. Like I've probably seen Tombstone like 300 oh, times. And every time I see it, like there's something else I pick up on. So that, that's that's my movie. So um, so we are at time. I appreciate the 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 soft ending here, the soft landing. But um, I do want to give uh, both you guys a chance for for a final thought. And we'll uh, we'll start with Jody, then we'll end with Jamie. So Jody, first final thoughts on the hiring process. Yeah. Um, yeah. This has been a great interview. Loved, uh, love the concepts, love the uh, information that you've been sharing. Uh, it, it's kind of nice because we kind of reflect back and, and, and on our own processes and, and a lot of it we, we're doing just like you're talking about, which is great. But there are, are a few things that we can improve on, which uh, I've definitely picked that up. Um, for the for the folks that don't want to go through that initial process, because we have an internal person that does that, and they and they don't want to spend the money on that internal person. You know, how do they reach out to you uh, to be that person and uh, guide them through this process? Yeah. So to connect with me, they can go over to growingyourteam.com and there they can schedule a call or learn more about how we work with our clients. Perfect. And, and then what's your final thought? That can't be your final thought. <laughs> <laughs> can't get out that easy. No, my final thought is I, I loved all the questions. And I think for, for those that are listening, it really goes to show that there is a lot to learn about hiring, no matter how many times that you've done it. And there's opportunities to do it better. And you know, just take the opportunity to learn, but also when you go to hire, 
the biggest thing is knowing who you need. Remember that your business is unique. It is different. Even if you're hiring the same position as someone else did for their business, you're going to want something different. So focus the entire process on who you need, who you're going to be happy with. Great. No, this is this is a great podcast. And I can always tell it is a great podcast because I have this little desk buddy board here who they're not a sponsor of the show, but like whenever it's full by the end of the podcast, because I'm taking notes of stuff I need to go back and work on. I'm like, okay, this was definitely a, a really good episode. So I have nowhere left to write on my little dry erase board that's right in front of me. So <laughs> so great job, Jamie. And I also um, really want to credit you. I think um, you know, I've worked with several people in this space. And a lot of times what I find is when you work with someone, it's here's our nine candidates for your role. And once they dry up, like they kind of go away, where I think you really, you know, you work on the front side of developing the interviewing process, developing the role with them and then help them find the role. I think that's pretty unique. and something that's not a lot of companies are doing. So I wanted to give you credit, but for, for definitely taking a different look at a a space that's a, that's pretty crowded. So, so great job there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It is one of those things. Like people always ask, well, what does your pool of candidates look like when like we get on that first call? And I was like, I don't have a pool of candidates yet. And they're like, wait, why? Like most recruiters do. And I was like, because I could have a pool of 1000 accountants, but if not one of them is who you need, who cares? So it's like, we approach everything fresh because we really focus on the right person for that position and that company. Yeah. It sounds like you're working for the company instead of for the people trying to find jobs, which is, which is very unique. So definitely appreciate that. Yep. Great. Well, uh, thanks again. And uh, thank you guys for uh, joining the show. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy this podcast. Visit our website at summitcpa.net to get more tips and strategies for achieving business success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry.